All right, so first things first, I have no conflicts of interest to disclose here today. Just to give you a brief outline of what I'll be talking about today, first I'll talk a little bit about the kidneys, what they do and why we should care about chronic kidney disease. Then I'll talk about the problem that I'm trying to solve, which is physical function decline in people with chronic kidney disease. I'll dive a little bit into the cardiorespiratory and muscle dysfunction or muscle function decrements that we see in this population, and then I'll wrap everything up with just a brief summary. All right, so the kidneys, are the small bean-shaped organs that are located in the posterior aspect of your abdominal cavity, so right around your lower back. Uh, as you can see on this picture right here, they're normally around the size of your uh, palm, but they can get pretty enlarged in certain diseases such as polycystic kidney disease. Now the kidneys uh, have several really important functions. Probably the most important function that we have for the kidneys is that they help regulate the amount of fluid in your circulation and therefore they regulate your blood pressure. They're also really tightly involved in mineral and pH homeostasis. They help you remove excess metabolic waste and they're also uh, involved in the production of several really important hormones, uh, specifically renin, uh, erythropoietin, and they're involved in the final activation of vitamin D, which is obviously very important for um, mineral homeostasis. Now chronic kidney disease is diagnosed as having a GFR, which is a marker of how well your kidneys are functioning, of less than 60 milliliters per minute, or markers of kidney damage, specifically having high levels of albumin in your urine, albuminuria, um, for, or both, for at least three months. Now, this at least three months is really important because you can also get, you know, be involved in a car accident or have an infection that gives you an acute kidney injury, but if your kidneys recover, then that was an acute kidney injury, not chronic kidney disease, which tends to be progressive. It gets worse over time. Now, chronic kidney disease is actually a pretty big, important problem that we have. We see that more than 800 million people around the world have some form of chronic kidney disease uh, between the stages of one to five, and about one in seven United States adults have chronic kidney disease. And it's also really expensive to our medical health care system. About 24% of our Medicare spending is spent on individuals with chronic kidney disease, which amounts to roughly about 130 or more than $136 billion per year. And unfortunately, chronic kidney disease is also quite deadly. Only about two in five individuals with end-stage kidney disease requiring hemodialysis survive past five years. And it's emerged as one of the leading causes of death worldwide. It's currently around uh, 12th uh, uh, in the leading causes of death, but it's projected that by the year 2040, chronic kidney disease is actually going to be the fifth leading cause of death worldwide. So it is uh, common, it's quite costly, and it is deadly as well. But moving specifically to the problem that I'm trying to face, which is this physical function decline that we have in people with CKD. Now when I say physical function, I specifically mean the ability to perform activity, activities of daily living. So these are things that you just always do on your daily routine. You know, walk from one room to another, go up a flight of stairs, carry groceries, all these activities that you require basically to survive on your own without somebody else helping you. And your ability to perform these activities of daily living is mostly dependent on your ability to perform these very basic physical movements, just being able to walk, being able to go up a flight of stairs, being able to carry an object and carry that, or pick up an object and carry that. And your ability to perform these very basic movements is dependent on several physical fitness attributes. Uh, specifically, your uh, cardiorespiratory fitness, which is what we call VO2 max, VO2 peak, but also your uh, muscle uh, properties, your muscle function, which includes muscle strength, muscle power, muscle endurance, and other things like your balance and your flexibility. All these physical fitness uh, attributes is what allows you to perform these very basic physical movements. Now, in individuals with chronic kidney disease, we see that they develop several complications that affect every single one of those physical fitness attributes. For example, we see individuals with chronic kidney disease often develop uh, and, uh, heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, what we call uh, diastolic heart failure. They also develop uh, pretty severe calcification of the arteries and blood vessels. And we see that individuals with chronic kidney disease usually suffer from some sort of neurological disorders, whether that's neuropathy or uh, impairments in functional sympatholysis, for example. And we also see that because of this chronic systemic inflammation associated with chronic kidney disease, these individuals tend to also develop fibrotic tissue in their lungs, which can impair lung function. 
as a result, we see that when you look at indices of physical functions, for example, gait speed, just a very simple test to see how fast you can walk. Uh, the six minute walk uh, test, which just measures how much distance you can cover in six minutes, walking at your, basically walking six minutes. And the timed up and go test, which just uh, looks at how much time it takes you to get up from a chair and walk a certain distance. When we look at all these measurements in individuals with just moderate CKD, so this is an advanced CKD, these are individuals with CKD stages between two and four, we see that gait speed, six minute walk test distance, and timed up and go are at least 30% lower than age predicted norms. So in these individuals that again, just have moderate chronic kidney disease, we already start seeing pretty, um, I don't want to say significant, but noticeable impairments in these physical function measurements. And when we look at individuals with advanced chronic kidney disease, and we compare them to other individuals with you know, more common or other uh, chronic diseases such as heart failure, chronic uh, obstructive pulmonary disorders, and those with several cardiovascular risk factors, when we look at their short physical performance battery score, which is a composite score of these three tests, the gait speed test, the balance test, and the sit, uh, sit to stand test, when we look at their gait speed and their grip strength, all of them are, are significantly lower in the individuals with renal failure compared to the individuals with other chronic conditions. So the takeaway point here is that physical function decline is already at least 30% lower than age predicted norms in moderate CKD. And patients with advanced CKD have poor physical function than those with other common chronic diseases. Now the kicker here is that in this study, the individuals with renal failure were actually kidney transplant candidates, meaning that they at least had enough physical function to be eligible for a new kidney. So this study was in fact biased towards higher functioning individuals with kidney failure. Now, here at the School of Medicine, we established probably one of the first uh, laboratories in the world that specialized, or in the country that specializes on cardiorespiratory fitness in people with chronic kidney disease. And when we look at uh, an individual with advanced chronic kidney disease on hemodialysis, you'll notice a couple of things. So we do a cardiopulmonary exercise test, which most people probably in this room know it just as a VO2 max test, okay? Looking specifically at this 56-year-old male uh, on hemodialysis compared to an age match control, when we look at their heart rate response, we see that the individual with advanced chronic kidney disease on hemodialysis only reached about 66% of his age-predicted maximal uh, heart rate, compared to the healthy individual who reached 88% of his age-predicted maximal heart rate. When we look at peak workload, so how much basically resistance, how much work, the, the highest work rate they were able to achieve, during the CPET, the individual on hemodialysis only reached 68 watts, which is only about 40% of his age predicted max, whereas the healthy individual was actually quite strong and he reached 170% of his age predicted max. And then finally, when we look at VO2 peak, the individual with advanced chronic kidney disease on hemodialysis only reached about 47% of his age predicted VO2 peak compared to the healthy individual who reached 36 milliliters per kilograms per minute, which is about 143% of his age predicted um, VO2 peak. Now to put that into perspective, a VO2 peak of 15.5 milliliters per kilogram per minute is equivalent to a little less than five mets. So for this individual right here that I'm describing, going up one flight of stairs would be equivalent to 100% of this person's VO2 peak. So it's pretty, pretty drastic impairment. Now you heard me say hemodialysis. If you get to a stage where your kidneys completely are shut down, they fail, then you'll start having excess fluid and uh, byproducts, toxins, and uh, other things that you normally your kidneys filter out start accumulating in your blood. So at that point, you're either gonna need a new kidney, a kidney transplant, or you're gonna need renal replacement therapy, which includes a kidney transplant or hemodialysis, where your blood essentially gets pumped back, pumped out, for, uh, goes through a dialysis machine that cleans it up, removes excess fluid, and then it gets put back in. Now you need this to survive once your kidneys fail, otherwise you would, uh, you're at a very high risk of cardiac arrhythmias and starting cardiac death, amongst other uh, complications. But despite this being a kind of necessary therapy for survival, this transition of having advanced chronic kidney disease to being on hemodialysis is a really stressful condition for your heart. We see that with uh, hemodialysis treatments, 
This myo we have myocardial stunting from the intradilytic hypotension. When you're going through dialysis, you have a lot of plasma fluid being released or being removed from circulation that decreases blood pressure and decreases the amount of blood flow going to the heart, which is a stress for the heart. We also see increased systemic inflammation from these foreign things that you're now uh, encountering. The contact with the membranes, uh, with the dialysis membranes and the catheters with dialysis, they trigger an innate immune response that essentially causes increased systemic inflammation that also can stress the cardiovascular system. And, we, and when we have these rapid fluid changes with hemodialysis, where now instead of just having a kidney that's always getting, helping you get rid of excess fluid and excess metabolites, now we have a four hour window to get rid of all these fluid and metabolites. That rapid change in fluid and metabolites increases the risk of arrhythmia and ischemic uh, injury to the heart as well. As a result, we see that in this transition, during the first four months after somebody initiates hemodialysis, we see a really big spike in mortality in this population. In fact, during that four month period after somebody initiates dialysis, we see a 20-fold increase uh, in mortality compared to in age match individuals, meaning that these individuals are basically 20 times more likely to die during this four-month period than other people their age. So our question was, does cardiorespiratory fitness decline after an individual goes through this transition? Okay, so this was a study I was able to publish uh, last year in JAHA, and we took 241 patients that had advanced chronic kidney disease, so stage five chronic kidney disease. 42 of them, though, had not yet transitioned into dialysis. 54 of them had been on dialysis for a year or less, meaning that they're pretty new to dialysis. And then the other 145 patients have been on dialysis for more than a year. And what we found was that individuals who had just started dialysis, so that red group right here in the middle, already had a significantly lower VO2P compared to the individuals who also had chronic kidney disease stage five, but had not yet started hemodialysis treatment. Now mind you, these are adjusted for other covariates that could impact this relationship. When we look at their left ventricular mass index, so how thick their left ventricles are, we also saw that the individuals who were new to dialysis also had significantly elevated left ventricular mass index. So because of this transition, then this stress on the heart, the heart is adapting by increasing their, uh, their mass, which is obviously not a good thing for uh, cardiovascular function. And when we remove those patients who have been on dialysis for a year or longer, but had a prior kidney transplant, meaning that they had an interruption in their chronic kidney disease, maybe they got a, a new kidney and it worked pretty well, then it stopped working, they went back on dialysis. When we took away those patients, we found that the individuals who have been on dialysis for longer than a year, also had significantly lower VO2P compared to the individuals who are new to dialysis. So our takeaway from this study was that first, initiating the dialysis, this transition that I was talking about does lead to a decrement or an impairment in VO2P and an increase in left ventricular mass. And mind you, these individuals are already impaired because of their kidney disease. So this transition, although it's life-saving, it's also detrimental. And VO2 peak looks like it continues to decline the longer somebody stays on hemodialysis uh, in the absence of a kidney transplant, meaning that if you get on dialysis, it's only gonna go downhill from there. Now, inherent for your typical hemodialysis treatments is a, a thrice weekly schedule, meaning that typically these individuals will get their hemodialysis treatments either on Monday, Wednesday, Friday, or Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday, four hours at a time. So they go to this clinic, they sit down, they get their blood pumped out and pumped back in for four hours, they go home and do it all over again three days per week. Now, inherent in this schedule is a longer period without dialysis, meaning that between Monday and Wednesday, you have one day without dialysis. Between Wednesday and Friday, you have one day without dialysis. But obviously, between Friday and Monday, you go an extra day without dialysis. And same thing for the Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday folks. And what we see is that on that first day of dialysis, when they haven't had dialysis for two days, we see a, a, a pretty drastic increase in mortality rates and in um, cardiovascular events, meaning that these individuals are at a pretty high risk on that first day when they haven't had dialysis uh, for two days. So our question, uh, and some of the potential mechanisms are one, we have an increase in calcium and phosphate levels that can predispose these individuals to cardiac arrhythmias and make the arteries a little stiffer. 
We also see the uh, increase in volume, this fluid volume accumulation that they get because they haven't had dialysis in two days, also predisposes them to ischemic injury. And we see that this increase in potassium, if, you know, when these individuals get on hemodialysis, they have all these dietary restrictions because, for example, if they have too many bananas, they have too much potassium, during the weekend before they get that dialysis treatment, you get a pretty scary you know, increase in potassium because your kidneys that normally help you get rid of that excess potassium are no longer working. So our question was, is cardiorespiratory fitness impaired during that, after that long interdialytic period, meaning, you know, can we see changes in VO2P depending on how long it's been since you've had hemodialysis? So this is a study that I've been working on and we're almost done. Uh, so far, this preliminary data includes 29 patients and we have a few more since then. But what we did was we had, we had them come in for three visits and we had them do, we had them do bioimpedance to look at fluid status. We did a CPET and then we did the short physical performance battery to look at physical function. And the three visits were, one of them was at the end of the three day interdialytic interval. So for a Monday, Wednesday, Friday patient, we would ask them to come in before they had dialysis on Monday when they haven't had dialysis since Friday. And similar thing for Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday people. The second visit was basically any other time right before they get dialysis. So for Monday, Wednesday, Friday, people would be right before they get dialysis on Wednesday or on Friday, as long as they've recovered from the first testing session. And then we compared those two visits to another visit that we did right after they got dialysis, basically the, the time when they're at their cleanest, when they have just gotten dialysis earlier that day. As we expected, we saw that the individuals, when they came in on the three-day inter interdialytic interval, they had significantly more body weight, they were heavier because they had excess fluid. You know, when we look at bowel impedance, it looks like they have more extracellular volume and pretty much whole body volume uh, during this three-day interval compared to due day, and then it was greater during the two-day compared to baseline. Again, that's what we expected because, because of how long it's been since they had dialysis. Now, when we look at VO2 peak, we uh, left it without adjusting for body mass because we knew that body mass was gonna be different. So we looked at just absolute changes in VO2 peak. And so far we saw no significant differences in VO2 peak between the three visits. But we did see that during the two and three day interval visits, these individuals tended to walk significantly slower compared to the baseline visit when they had just had dialysis. So, so far, this preliminary data suggests that excess volume accumulation in between dialysis sessions does uh, contribute to the physical function impairments that we see in this population. Now, my simple hypothesis on why this is happening is if you weigh more, you're going to walk slower, but there may be other mechanisms involved, and we're hoping to start digging into those here a little bit. Now, there are other ways of doing hemodialysis. You can do hemodialysis at home, which is basically the same as idea as going to an in-center home, uh, or excuse me, an in-center dialysis clinic, but except with home hemodialysis, you can do dialysis whenever you want. Most people will do it at night while they're sleeping because that's probably the most convenient. Um, or they can basically do it whenever they want, whatever fits their schedule best and their caretaker because you need a caretaker when you do this. You can also do what we call peritoneal dialysis where instead of having your blood pump back out, clean and pump back in, you have a dialysis fluid that gets infused into your peritoneum, you're basically the inside of your belly. That dialysis fluid essentially cleans up your blood because all the toxins and excess fluid filters out into your peritoneum, and then you drain it out. And then you can do this as three to four times per day at your own time, uh, and again, it gives you, the point of these two forms of dialysis is that they give you a little bit more control of your fluid volume because instead of just having this four hour gap to get rid of excess fluid, you can do it over an extended period of time, which reduces some of the post-dialysis symptoms that we see. But if you have so much fluid being removed in a short period of time, we see a lot of cramping in these patients, and it looks really painful, like all cramps are. And they also get really fatigued. Basically, after somebody gets done with a hemodialysis treatment, they just want to go home and sleep. So these two forms of dialysis allows you more freedom to also exercise, because you don't have to go to a clinic every, basically every other day. Uh, you can do it at home, and these individuals tend to have a better quality of life. Okay? Now, the data is a little bit mixed, but some studies have found that the individuals that are on home hemodialysis, that get frequent hemodialysis treatments, instead of just going three days per week, they get dialysis treatments basically every day at night. They uh, have uh, only about 
a third of the mortality rate as individuals who are on conventional hemodialysis. So again, the data is mixed. Some studies have shown no differences, but some studies have shown that individuals on home hemodialysis do better. They survive longer. So we wanted to know if any other forms of dialysis are better for cardiorespiratory fitness. Now this study is ongoing and we don't have any preliminary data yet because we just have too few patients so far. But in this study, what we're doing is we're comparing, we have 25 individuals who are on conventional hemodialysis, 25 who are on home hemodialysis, and then 25 who are receiving peritoneal dialysis. And we're trying to match all of them for the same amount of time on dialysis, meaning that we're not comparing you know, individuals that just started home hemodialysis to individuals that have been on conventional dialysis for months. We're trying to match them for how long they've been on the treatment for. And we're looking at some of these uh, measurements, so physical function measurements, cardiopulmonary exercise testing to look at VO2 peak, and uh, body composition to see if there's any changes from the baseline visit to 12 months later. Because the point of this study is not only to see if there's any differences just at baseline, but to see if the type of dialysis treatment that you're doing is going to slow down these decrements that we're seeing in cardiorespiratory fitness. So our hypothesis is that patients on either short daily hemodialysis done at home or peritoneal dialysis will have a slower decline in VO2 peak compared to the individuals who have been on, who are on conventional hemodialysis. Like I said, study is ongoing, we just don't have enough data for me to really show you anything. And then another question that I have is, what is the best way to do these VO2 max measurements on people with chronic kidney disease? The reason we ask that question is because right now the standard ramp CPEP protocol that we use, where basically we just progressively increase the resistance on the bike every minute, or technically every second because it's a ramp protocol, has three main issues. The first issue is the most common question that I get from my patients is, how long do I have to exercise for? That's a legitimate question. But we can't give them an answer because with this protocol, we essentially just set the protocol, it increases resistance every minute, and they just keep going until they physically cannot keep exercising anymore. Some patients will last five minutes, some will last 15 minutes. It just depends on how long they're able to go. But studies have found that if you know how long you're going to exercise for, you tend to do better. You pace yourself and you can push yourself a little harder if I'm telling you, you only have to keep going for another minute as opposed to telling you, keep going, keep going, keep going. You're gonna push yourself a little harder if you know the study endpoint. The second issue that we have is that this form of exercise of progressively increasing the resistance every second is a very unnatural way to exercise. There's just no ecological validity here. There's no real exercise scenario where you have to exercise this way. So it's very difficult to say this test is, has good ecological validity. And then also, the subject has absolutely no control over their exercise intensity. All they can do is respond to the exercise stimulus to the exercise demand and basically just stop when they feel like they need to stop. They don't have any control whatsoever, whereas when you exercise normally, you can decide to run faster or run slower <laughs> or regulate your exercise intensity based on how you feel. Because of this, whenever an, an individual stops exercising, it's difficult to know whether they've reached their physiological limit or their psychological limit. It just adds a subjective motivational aspect that's difficult to control for everyone, especially in a population of individuals with multiple comorbidities and you know, other symptoms that makes it difficult for them to really want to push themselves. So we've designed this study that we're currently uh, recruiting patients for and we haven't uh, recruited any patients yet. We just started uh, this week where we just got approval for everything. And basically we're comparing the standard ramp, so again, in the standard ramp, we just progressively increase resistance over time. And we're comparing that to a ramp incremental step exercise. So basically with the ramp incremental step exercise protocol, we do the exact same thing, the standard ramp protocol, but then we give them about a five to 10 minute break in between to just rest, drink some water, and then we increase the resistance on the bike to a constant load so we don't keep increasing the load, we just increase the load and keep the load the same, to about 95 to 110% of their peak workload during the ramp exercise test. Some other uh, authors uh, really just call this a verification phase. Because the idea is that if you reach your true peak at the end of the ramp, if we increase resistance to 110% of that workload, then we shouldn't see another increase in your VO2. 
because you already reached your peak. But however, if we do see an increase in your VO2 during that verification phase, then we can say that standard ramp that you did initially underestimated your VO2 peak because we can obviously make it go even higher. In the self-paced protocol, this is pretty new protocol, but basically, instead of us controlling the work rate, or in really the computer controlling the work rate, we're gonna, have, we're gonna show the individual ratings of perceived exertion that corresponds to light, hard, uh, this should be, I uh, think, moderately hard, very hard, and uh, maximal effort. And we basically ask the individual to adjust the resistance on the bike to match the rating of perceived exertion that we, uh, that we identified for them. So the first two minutes, we're gonna ask them to adjust the, the bike to an RPE of 11, to what feels light. And then for the next two minutes, somewhat hard, hard, very hard, until the last two minutes of maximal effort. Now, with the verification, with the RISE protocol, uh, studies have found, and this particular study was in individuals uh, who were obese with metabolic syndrome, that the standard ramp test actually underestimated VO2 peak in about 40% of the sample, meaning that basically they were able to achieve higher VO2s after, during that verification phase. And as far as the self-paced protocol, they've Again, it is pretty new, but they've done it in healthy individuals that are active and individuals that are post-myocardial infarction or in cardiac rehab. And they have found that the self-paced protocol where the individual is in charge, they know how long the test is gonna be. It's gonna be 10 minutes, no matter what. And they get to change the resistance to what they feel is their maximal effort. That protocol actually does show to elicit significantly higher VO2 peaks than just your standard ramp. So our hypothesis is that the Two protocols that we're testing are going to be better than the ramp, uh, than the standard ramp in eliciting a higher VO2 peak, and that the self-paced protocol will lead to the highest VO2 peak, again, because it addresses those issues that I mentioned earlier. Now the individual, I can tell them, you're going to exercise for 10 minutes, so give me all you got for those 10 minutes, because you know how long you're going to be here for. And they get to control the resistance, which just gives them a little bit more confidence and allows them to really push themselves to what they feel like they can push themselves to. And then the last study that, I, uh, that I'm working on is probably going to take up my entire summer, but I'm really excited about this study. We're partnered up with the Regan Street Institute, and we collected data for every single adult that has been referred for cardiopulmonary exercise testing in Indiana University Hospital and Eskenazi between January of 2005 and the time where we proposed the study, which was in August. We've just recently been able to capture more patients because obviously we're in you know, it's March 2023. So this number is actually higher now. It's about 1,900, a little over 1,900 patients. And this is going to be the largest epidemiological study to look at the relationship between renal function and VO2 peak. Because again, a lot of the studies that we're looking at just have very small sample sizes. So this will allow us to look at the potential different factors that regulate VO2 peak in these individuals and really give us a nice data set to look at some other things that we're interested in. Now, beyond just cardiorespiratory fitness, I'm particularly personally interested in muscle function, so I started looking into this a little bit more. And when we say muscle function, of course, we're talking about strength, we're talking about power, we're talking about endurance. Now, endurance, uh, muscle endurance is a little bit more uh, easy to understand, just how many times you can lift a weight, uh, a submaximal weight. But strength and power are different because in strength, you're really just looking at the maximal ability to produce force. Whereas when you're looking at muscle power, you're including both the product of force and velocity. So it gives you that velocity component that you don't necessarily get when you're just looking at uh, force measurements alone. And the reason that I really got interested in this for this population is that when you look at older individuals that have mobility impairments, meaning older adults that have a short physical performance battery score of a nine or lower, meaning they have, they, they're trending towards that area of needing somebody else to help them with their activities of daily living. Compared to older individuals that don't have these physical limitations, when we look at their decrements in force, so this is torque, which is a, you know, angular force, and power, you'll notice that the biggest decrements that we see in their ability to produce force is at these higher contraction velocities, at about 180 to 240 degrees per second. Meaning that when we're comparing whether or not somebody has impairments in physical function, rather than just looking at isometric strength measurements, 
or other measurements that just look at force, it really makes sense to look at how quickly they're able to contract because these seems to be the biggest difference between having physical mobility or physical function limitations or not. And another reason I cared about is because this in, in this Inchianti study, they found that the individuals who had, who were on the lowest quartile of leg power, actually had about a two to three fold greater risk or likelihood of developing physical function limitations or having an SVVV score of nine or lower compared to you know, hip strength and knee strength. Meaning that again, in this study, it seems like muscle power is a better predictor of physical function decline than muscle strength. Now, despite this, muscle power is very poorly addressed in the clinical setting. And really, the, in terms of lifestyle interventions, exercise interventions, and people with chronic kidney disease, no study so far has included muscle power as an aim or as an outcome to see if exercise, improving muscle power through exercise can improve some of these physical function outcomes that, that I've been talking about. Now, I have preliminary data from that study with the interdialytic periods, and I was able to take 21 of the patients that were able to complete the sit-to-stand test, which is just asking the patients to get up from a chair as, as quickly as they can and see how, how long it takes for them to do five repetitions. Um, and I took the results and compared them to 21 healthy people from another cohort that I've been working on, so healthy individuals, and I was able to match them pretty well in terms of age and sex. So, when I compare uh, muscle power between the healthy individuals and the individuals with advanced chronic kidney disease on, on hemodialysis, I found that when you look at absolute po power and relative power, so making it, normalizing it to body mass, the individuals on uh, hemodialysis, despite again being relatively the same age and being, you know, not that the, the people on, on hemodialysis had a, a greater proportion of men or women, we saw that the individuals to hemodialysis had significantly lower mo absolute muscle power and power related to their, or normalized to their body mass. Now, when I calculated muscle power for these individuals, I used a validated equation from the sit to stand test. So the equation that I use, although it's not, you know, looking at isokinetic testing uh, or force, uh, force plate testing, it's still a validated equation. Now, I found that in the, in, again, this is, this is just for the individuals on hemodialysis, relative power, so their power relative to their body mass was significantly correlated to their SPPV score. Now that wasn't too surprising because again, I'm taking muscle power from the sit to stand test, which is incorporated in the SPPV score, so it shouldn't be too surprising that there's a relationship there. I'm getting one measurement from the other. But what was surprising was that relative power was significantly correlated with gait speed meaning that the individuals who tended to have better muscle power also had better gait speed, which is a really pretty good index of physical function in the, uh, in, in the, in the clinical populations. And when I did a multivariate analysis, so I adjusted for things like age, sex, fat-free mass through bioimpedance, and VO2 peak, I found that relative power was still significantly associated with SPPV score and gait speed, again, despite adjusting for these other covariates. Now, this is preliminary data, it's only 21 people, but it is interesting, I said, like I said, particularly because nobody else has really looked or dived into muscle power in this population. Now, one of the questions I have was, like, okay, well, maybe muscle power really is impaired in this population, but why? What are some of the potential mechanisms behind this? So uh, we recently submitted a meta-analysis for, uh, for publication, and I'm working with uh, Ashley Troutman and Dr. Keith Avin over in the Department of uh, Physical Therapy on this. And uh, Ashley actually took the lead, the lead on this study. But we took 106 studies. Out of those 106 studies, nine, uh, 69 of them uh, looked at muscle, uh, muscle fiber size in, or cross-sectional area or muscle measurements of size in individuals with chronic kidney disease compared to those individuals without chronic kidney disease. And then the other 37 studies looked at animal models of chronic kidney disease and compared those to individuals or to uh, uh, wild type animals. And when we put all these studies together into a meta-analysis, we found that skeletal muscle atrophy was present in individuals with end-stage kidney disease, but as well as individuals with chronic kidney disease that are a little bit more mild, stages three to four. We also found that uh, skeletal muscle atrophy was present in the animal models of CKD. So these are animals that either had five-sixths of their kidneys removed to induce chronic kidney disease, 
or they were fed a high, uh, high adenine diet to also elicit chronic kidney disease. But the most important finding for me in this study was that when we looked at the studies that specifically look at cross-sectional area in type 1 and type 2 muscle fibers, we saw that atrophy was present in the type 2 muscle fibers, but we didn't see significant atrophy in the type 1 muscle fibers, which is what we see in the natural aging process. As we get older, we have a preferential loss of type 2 muscle fibers, which a lot of you in, in, in this classroom are, are my old students. Hopefully you remember the type 2 muscle fibers are the ones that allow you to produce a uh, high degree of power. They contract a lot quicker than the type 1 muscle fibers. So this is a potential mechanism why we might see decrements in muscle power in this population. In fact, when we look at individuals with chronic kidney disease, it's often called a model of accelerated aging, meaning that if you have chronic kidney disease, you develop the same phenotype as a much older individual much quicker because of this accumulation of uremic toxins, inflammation, and other uh, characteristics that are typical of the aging process, of the normal aging process. All right, so to summarize everything that I've talked about today, physical function decline is a major complication in individuals with chronic kidney disease, and this is primarily because of impairment in muscle function, but also in cardiorespiratory fitness. Cardiorespiratory fitness declines further when you start hemodialysis treatment, so although it's necessary for survival, especially if you're not eligible for a kidney transplant, it seems to really progress your condition and make it worse, lead you towards that path of uh, functional dependence. And it looks like more frequent hemodialysis treatments or potentially peritoneal dialysis could be better for cardiorespiratory fitness, but we're still not sure until we finish our study, so hopefully we'll finish that. And the current protocols that we use to look at VO2peak may actually be underestimating VO2peak in some of these individuals because of the issues that I highlighted earlier. So it's possible that some of the newer CPAP protocols that we're testing uh, could lead to more valid cardiorespiratory fitness measurements. And skeletal muscle power, I believe, could be the key to improving physical function in individuals with chronic kidney disease. But at this moment, nobody's really looking at muscle power in terms of you know, aims and outcomes when designing studies involving exercise in this population. So we really need more studies that look at more specifically muscle power and seeing if improving muscle power through exercise or other lifestyle interventions could improve physical function outcomes. All right, so that's all I got. I just want to acknowledge the people in my lab that have just helped me a lot since I've been here. This gentleman right here in the middle is Dr. Kenneth Lim. He's my advisor, and he's been great. Uh, Drake right here is actually a graduate of the Department of Kinesiology, and he's now our research exercise physiologist. He's mostly in charge of doing all the testing that I've been talking about today. And I mean, I'm, I'm glad he went here because he obviously knows what he's doing. And uh, I also like to thank my mentorship team uh, for my T32. They've been wonderful. They've helped me a lot, which is becoming a lot more of a mature scientist. So thank you all so much for being here. I really appreciate your time. And please let me know if you have any questions.